an aunt, Alice. Aunt Alice went to be with the Lord years ago. When I was small, I don't mean real small, I was old enough to drive from Winnipeg to southern Ontario to see her before she died. And, uh, but I wasn't married yet. I, was, I got married when I was 20, so we were pretty young. And I went to see her, and she was dying of cancer. And she was bloated, and she was in pain, and it was awful. And I went out, and I prayed, God, take her home. And she died that night. And then I had guilt. Oh, man. Like magical thinking, like a five-year-old that thinks it's his fault that his parents split up or it's his fault that this happened. But you know what? We do that still as Christians. Like we are in control of what's happening in the world and not God. But that's not what was in the sermon. I don't know why I told you that part. My Aunt Alice was a very, very bright lady. But she was, she was a third of three, and then my grandparents had nine more, and my dad's the youngest, and he's 88. So we're talking a long time ago, and there was this thing called the Spanish flu came through, and the two oldest kids died, and my Aunt Alice ended up with such a high fever that she broke her eardrums and was deaf from when she was like six months old. And so basically she was like born deaf. And so she talked like, (laughs) and I understood her. But back then, if you were deaf and you couldn't talk, people treated you like you were dumb. That's the word dumb. We didn't have one hand sign language. We had A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. JK, I could do them all. We had money. We had black people. She'd be embarrassing to take to the, to the mall. But ultimately, I would get so angry at people that treated her dumb. She had the most beautiful cursive sign writing. She went to school for six months because you had to go to a special sanitarium school away from home. So she came home after six months of schooling. She was one of the best red ladies I knew. She was brilliant. She worked her whole life in Exeter Hospital, in Exeter, Ontario, in the laundry. She bought beautiful things for people and was a beautiful lady and a great older sister to my dad. So I was very fond of my aunt. But we would go places and people would treat her dumb and I would get so angry. And she would get so frustrated because she couldn't communicate. I could understand her mumbling the way the two kids mumble at each other. But other people couldn't. I guess we should get to our text because I could tell stories all day and they'd have nothing to do with God's word and why we came to church, right? So, (laughs) Pastor Clint, can I tell you a secret? And you promised not to tell him I said this? When he phoned and said he had COVID, I was so happy. (laughs) That means I got to come and share God's word with you. And the whole time I pastored, and it was a long time, I would say, I don't care if I ever preach again. That's a part of the job I hate the worst. It's a necessary evil to do what I do, which is minister to people. But you know what? When something's taken away from you, and you realize the communion with God you have as you prepare to give his words to people, I've started to really miss it. And so when he said, oh, hello, John, and I said, oh, yeah, do you need me to be preach tomorrow? <laughs> Even though I had no time to prepare. It was like, God will give me what I need to prepare. I'll tell you another story. One Christmas, we came here for Christmas to be with Ginny and Clint, and we were pastoring in Armstrong, and Sunday, I mean, Monday was Christmas Day, so we spent Sunday here for Christmas, 
and we were driving home Christmas night. And I had to preach the next morning. And then after church, we were going to drive through to Winnipeg and see grandmas and grandpas and all the rest. I'm getting a call as I'm coming down the hill into Clinton from a number I don't recognize in Armstrong. I was pastoring. And we take the phone. It's on the speaker, so I'm all legal. It's hands-free. And there's a lady on the phone. She's very upset. She lives in Prince George, but she's home with her mom, or with her dad now, because her dad, her mom died the night before. And they're trying to make funeral announcements, and they didn't want to phone me Christmas morning. And her mom used to teach at the Christian school that we used to have in our church. Sound familiar? But when things change, people get offended, and they stop going to church, and she's still a Christian, but and now the daughter's in this place where, what do I do? Can we use the church? Our old pastor will come and do the service. I'm like, whatever. This is God's house. Of course you can. Can I come and see you? So I'm taking this call, and we're having this conversation. I'm cruising down into Clinton. Now, did you know that there's two warning signs before the sign that says you have to slow to 70? No, there is no slow to 70. It goes right to 50. So let's assume you're by the trailer park there on the right with the barbecue sign, and it's already 50, and you're just slowing down from 105, thinking it should be slowed down by now. And sure enough, I'm coming out the other side of Clinton, and the lights come on. I get pulled over, and I have to say to the lady, I'll call you right back. I'm getting pulled over. I think I might have done something wrong. And it was embarrassing. What has this got to do with Mark? Anyways, um, I know what it has to do with it. The policeman pulls me over, and he asks me, what's going on? Why wouldn't you slow down when the sign said, I didn't see the signs. He says, there's three of them. Oh, my. He says, what's happening? So I told him the truth. I said, well, I'm a pastor. I'm driving home. I've got to go see this people I've never met before. Their mom died last night. I'm leaving tomorrow after preaching to go to Winnipeg, and I just had my mind on other stuff. And he said, if I give you a ticket, I will have to confiscate your car because you're doing more than double the speed limit. And the only word I heard was, if. And I thought, oh, good, I'm not getting a ticket today. Yes, officer, anything I can do. I'm so sorry, officer. I'll be more careful, officer. Do you have to work on Christmas Day? That must be hard on you. I did the whole thing, right? And I got out of the ticket. But the word that he used was if. Um, how many of you have ever taken a course on communication where they say, like, yeah, and they say, how, what percentage of things are the actual words you say? Is what's communicated. Well, it depends what course you take. They could say 12, they could say 20, but some say as much as 30% of the actual words. Some of them will say, and they'll separate the rest into two, they'll say body language or tone. And, but they'll also talk about one thing that's important was the inflection. It might be almost as much as the body language. That's why we can listen to an audio book and we can see it, because if the person reading the book's really good. And that's why when you read to your kids, you don't just read the way somebody with ADD reads. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. You, you use the real, because it, and so when the policeman said, if I give you a ticket, I knew already I wasn't getting a ticket. I was so appreciative. This is really important because we're going to get to a part in this text where I have been stuck for years whenever I read Mark 7. And when Clint said, can you preach tomorrow, my mind instantly went to, you're not going to ask me to preach about the lady that, uh, that, that Jesus said, why would I give the bread that's meant for the 
children to the dogs. And I went, "Uh uh-oh. How can you preach that? Is that preachable? Well, apparently, somebody with ADD can't get past something. He has to figure it out first. So you're going to hear what I feel God's told me was going on in that situation. And then there's also going to be a challenge about what do you do with that? Because it's very real. Can you imagine? We'll get to the text. Let's go to the text. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come to Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of the disciples eating food with their hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they, were, unless they gave their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the traditions of the elders. When they came from the marketplace, they did not eat unless they wash. And they observed many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. It is written, these people honor me with their lips, but in their hearts they're far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachers are but rules taught by man. You go, you have let go of the commands of God and hold on to traditions of men. I'm just going to paraphrase the next little bit because he says, okay, here you go. You think you're so smart. God's word says, honor your mother and father. Take care of them. There's another place in the New Testament where it says the person who doesn't take care of his, the widows in his family, the ones in need, the orphans, is worse off than an unbeliever. Like we are called to not, like we have our family, our extended family, our church family, our community, our neighbors, our, and there's levels of love, but maybe more levels of responsibility. And he says to the Pharisees, you guys are so worried about how much happens when we pass the plate when you come to the synagogue you've let people say, whatever I was supposed to give to my parents, I'm going to give to God. And then uh, you even hold it against them when they do something to help their dad because they were supposed to give it to God because you made them promise. You set aside what God's heart is for your rules. Now, before we get too carried away, think of it this way. We have a ton of rules in the church. I notice none of you are drinking coffee in here. I don't know why. I drink coffee in church. Maybe you look at me strange, but but even better, let's say we know that Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name. So we teach our kids and we teach ourselves and we do it. You have to pray in Jesus' name. If you don't say at the end of the prayer, in the name of Jesus, God might not really even hear you, hey? We have our little traditions. And I'm picking on some that are out there, but music may be one of them. The way we dress. Now, we're not here. We're in the caribou. But when I grew up in the big church in Winnipeg, like, I mean, it was like going to Broadway Tabernacle in Vancouver. You better wear your tie. But anyways, we have traditions too. And there's nothing wrong with traditions. Traditions are there to point us towards God. One of the things you learn when you, you do courses on grief counseling and stuff is that when we don't know what else to do, we go to a tradition. That's why we need funerals. That's why we need closure. That's why we need things that say, I don't know what to do. My world's out of control. Let's bring things into control again. And the church would be, without traditions, it would be hard to run... See, the church is not just a living organism, the body of Christ. It's also an organization that has mandates and purposes and God-given goals and God-given assignments. And without some of these traditions or organization, how would it ever happen? 
but also we have to be spontaneous and be the living organism, ready to hear the Ruah word of God telling you exactly what to do today. So it's, it's kind of that crazy mix. And not everything the Pharisees said was bad. Like he said to them at times, he says, you know, you tithe right down to this, and so you should. But what about what you're ignoring here? And it always had to do with putting rules on other people that were impossible to keep and judging people and comparing people and comparing yourself to people. It's really... Anyways, so there's the Pharisee part there. And in, did you know that the book of Mark is probably the very first gospel written? Traditionally thought, like, here's John Mark. Oh, by the way, my name's John Mark, John Mark Kendrick. But anyways, he's called John in Greek. He's called Mark in Roman, and he's called John Mark in Hebrew. And the book of Mark is written by John Mark. And he was the guy who went with, Paul, and then he kind of deserted them on the first missionary journey halfway through and went home because he was homesick. And uh, they had such a big fight about it, Barnabas and Paul, that he, he, they, had, they end up going different ways in different missions. And not then, because when they started their next missionary journey, Barnabas said, okay, we're bringing John Mark with us. <laughs> Paul said, are you out of your mind? He deserted us last time. And they did this kind of fight, and there's this thing happening. So John Mark's in the middle of a lot of controversy. But you notice at the end of Paul's ministry, he says, send John Mark to me. He's such a comfort to me. He can help me in so many ways. And even after the end of Paul's ministry, church tradition has it that he was the person who was the assistant to Peter in Rome, and it was there that he wrote down the book of Mark. Can you put up that first map for me? The one that says from Mark whatever. No, the other one. Well, let's look at this one first. Let's look at that one first. Okay. Now, I know these people like Clint that have gone to the Holy Land, they know this stuff inside out. I don't remember this stuff. It's like when somebody shows me a map of Vancouver and then five years later tells me to go to such and such a street. I don't know. (laughs) Unless you've been there and experienced it, right? So some of you probably know this like the back of your hand, but I don't. So I had to get the maps out and I had to look. And it's like, okay, where's where's Jerusalem? Well, it's got to be way down here. And on this map, about this much is 30 miles. So at least a day's walk, right? So there's there, there's Bethlehem right by Jerusalem. Oh, what good ever comes from Nazareth? It's up there. The Sea of Galilee is that little place up there. This side over here, we're going to talk about that. And up at the top there, there's Tyre and Sidon. And over at the top where that little lake is there. So that's, uh, we're going to talk about that place too. The reason that was important is because with my ADD and I'm reading this text. And remember, he left, sent the disciples out to go to Bethesda. If I had a pointer, I could do this. Bethesda is at the top of the lake where the green meets the, the pink. That's still part of Israel. This part over here, that's Syria. That wasn't part of Israel at the time either. And that part up above Bethesda, all the green and part of the pink as well, but certainly Tyre and Sidon, they're not part of Israel. The people that live there aren't Jewish. Well, that's not quite true. Most of the people that lived over here in this green part, and this part here I can't pronounce right, they're what they call Hellenistic Jews. They're people that are Jewish descent that have given up on the whole idea of Yahweh. They're Hellenistic in that they 
they have all kinds of temples up in there that were built by Jewish people to Zeus. And they bought into the lie that the most powerful god in the world is the warrior god, not the god of love, not the creator god, not the relational god. And so when you read, like Clint preached from Mark 5, where he comes across and there's this demonic guy who they can't chain him down, he's living in the caves, he's doing whatever. That's on this side of the lake, over here. And it says later on that he went to this area and told them about Jesus. And that's really important because the text wouldn't make sense without knowing that. Because you've talked, Clint's talked, I don't know how many times as we go through the book of Mark, that Jesus is trying to get away with his disciples to just be with them, to give them rest, to give them time to pray, to give them time to teach, to spend time with these few whatever. And so he sends them out in the boat from this side, and they're going to go to Bethesda. And he walks out on the water, Matthew, filling in the details, does the whole Peter gets out of the boat and sinks and comes up, keep your eyes on Jesus. I was so impressed with Clint could leave that aside and preach just the text he had. Because you could get so lost on the idea of this amazing story that Peter walked on water. And then you could even get into the beating down Peter, the poor guy. He's the only guy brave enough to get out of the boat. But anyways, ADD again. They don't land in Bethesda. He brings them, dabs bank into the middle of this little part over here. Let's put the other map up because it blows up that part. Even the speaker likes this map better than me. So, they're here. Got to go into there. They come here. He meets them walking on the lake, and instantly they are here. That doesn't make much sense, does it? And that's where something else really is important that we learn in our text. These Pharisees come from Jerusalem to the Hellenistic Jew area because they want to rub shoulders and say, we're part of this, you know, he's doing miracles, he can feed 5,000 people, we're, we're on his side. And he gets really in their face about it. You guys are trying to make rules to get in the way of people hearing the good news. There's a part at the end here. I didn't, I didn't read the whole thing, but... Boy, let's get to this one part. He went on. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For with, from within, out of the man's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murders, adulteries, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander. Boy, they're bad. All of these evil things come from outside. That's what makes him unclean. Verse 19, for if it doesn't go into your heart, but into your stomach, and then out of your body, it can't make you unclean. And then there's in brackets. How many of you read from the NIV? Probably all of you that are ADD a little bit because it's nice and simple, about the grade six reading level like the newspaper. It's got in brackets after. It says it in all the others too. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. How come it took them three more years to figure this out? When Jesus has the vision with the sheep coming down and all the different creatures, and oh, I haven't touched any of that stuff ever. That's unclean. If God says it's clean, it's clean. So he does it to him seven times, you know, just to. But he, he was there and he had this. Very interesting to me. 
Okay, now we get to the hard part. Jesus left that place and he went to the vicinity of Tyre. And he entered a house. Now you notice every time Clint said they enter a house, it's because he's going to teach his disciples something. He didn't want anyone to know he was there. He wanted to be incognito. If you were here and Israel stopped here and you went up to Tyre and that's 30 miles, when Clint keeps pressing that he tries to get away with his disciples. How many times have you heard him say they couldn't even eat? I get tired of hearing that, but that's okay. He's driving home a point that Jesus needs to spend time individually with each person. That he has to talk to you and connect with you. And sometimes all the noise around us is what distracts us. And Jesus calls us to get away and be with him individually and as families and as your small Bible study group. And even this morning, there's enough of us here that maybe this is about what he took with him. Maybe it was only the 13 of them. I don't know, but it was a very small group, and he took them to get away from everything. But he couldn't keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. I think I said that right. And she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First let the children eat all they want, he told her for it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in the bed and the demon gone. That's a hard scripture for me. Is that hard for you to hear? Well, it was very hard. So what do I do? I pretend I'm a Bible scholar when I'm not, because I have the tools. You have them too, probably, even on the internet. And you look up the word Jesus used for dog. Now, I, in my mind, heard the word that he used in Matthew 6, verse 7, where he says, don't give these dogs and pigs the pearls that are made for him. He'll just trample them under feet and then come and tear you apart. Or where he used the word dog in, Philipp in, in uh, Philemon 2, verse 3, I think. It says something to the effect of, these people are trying to make you circumcised. They are evil dogs trying to consume you. They have unhealthy sexual immorality, and he lists every evil thing you can think of and labels them there with the dog. I thought of what this, my somewhat friend who didn't pay his bill called my mother. That's the dog you hear. Or even if you get to Revelation 22 and he talks about after he's brought those into heaven and he says about the people that were born Jewish who did not accept Christ, he says, and they were cast out those dogs and has a whole string of what he calls them and what their real heart was like. Because the children of Israel are something that's from within. So that's what I thought. Did you bring your dog with you? Oh, come here. Come here. 
Now, most men are scared of this dog because he bites men, right? He did, but not me. Isn't he precious? And blind. What a beautiful dog. It's your pet. You're part of the family. Yeah. Did you hear anything in there that sounded like those things from Matthew or Philemon or from Revelation? Jesus used a different word. He used the word for ace. It depends on which you compare it to, because it's only used once in the New Testament. In other texts, it's referred to as your house pet, your puppy, your little dog. That's not the evil, wild dog who's there to consume you. That's not the infidel dog. That is the family still. And he says to this lady, I'm here for the Israelites first. Why would I take the bread that's I'm specifically here to give to them and give it to the family pet? Part of the family. He's making a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. That's what he's doing there. And she hears the word, if I give you a ticket. And she says, hey, um, you know, the puppy still gets the crumbs that fall off the table. She hears if. And he says, because you answer this way, you can go. Your daughter's healed. It's, it's really a, a story of redemption. It's a story of a foretelling of all these things God does. You know, Jesus came and there was, you hear Clint talk about it all the time. Sorry to keep referring to Clint, but when you're working through a series, and it wasn't me, I keep thinking, he, I can hear him saying it, that there's this idea that Jesus came to fulfill what the Father gave him to do. Only what God told him to do. I only say the words I heard from the Father. You see, there's a lot of things that Jesus came to make right, but not right then. There's a shadows of what's going to happen all the way through the gospel. There's this idea of slavery. What an awful thing. And Jesus didn't come and make it right. There's the oppression of the Romans and the cruelty and the stealing from God, God's stuff. Putting on godly people in charge of the temple. There's things that he could have just dug his teeth into, and that's something you have to care of. What about human trafficking? Think Jesus could have taken care of that when he was here? He came to do one thing, and that's to do the will of the Father and to make a way for us to be in relationship with him, to break down all the barriers that go between him and us, which is sin. And he came to do that, but he still healed the centurion's child. He still drove the demon out of this lady's girl. He still did so much of that because that's what it was all about. I find it very hard to imagine Mark writing this down and knowing the end of the story, that he becomes the evangelist, he becomes the missionary, he becomes that voice to the Romans when he's recording what's here, not to try to, you know, cover up the part that separates that these are God's chosen people to begin with and try to just tell the part of the story that we're all part of God's family now. But he was hard enough on himself and hard enough on his audience to let them know there was a distinction. But on the cross, Christ changed all that. He was probably there when Paul wrote things like, now in Christ there is no longer Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, slave or free. We are all one in Christ. But he was beginning way ahead of the story if he didn't acknowledge the fact that the Jewish people were God's called special people. 
That's all there was to it. Now, there's something about that between you and me. <sighs> Boy. This is kind of weird, too. This idea that... We know who God is. We read the end of the book. Like, I mean, how many... Laurel and I watched through Star Wars again. All nine episodes. We're up to eight now. We know the end. Took the drama out of it, you know. But we know the end. It was really hard watching people go bad in episodes two and three. Like, it was awful. But anyways, we know the end, so we put up with it. You know the end. You know Jesus is coming back, and he's going to. He's gone to prepare a place just for you that where you are, he's going to be take you with him. That's special. I don't know if this lady knew all that, but she knew who Jesus was, and she knew what he could do, but that wasn't enough. I don't think it's enough with us. She had to acknowledge where she was at and her need of Jesus for far more than just deliverance for her daughter. She was once a far-off people that God will bring close, to put it in another term of Scripture. I think I've said what I want to say about this, that it's not the same, but now it is. But I want to read from Matthew because it fills in a couple of those gaps as well. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and to Sidon. Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terrible from demon possession. Jesus didn't answer him a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away. She keeps crying out after us. We had a little guy, he was little, probably 24, but he was a little guy because when you do crystal meth, you're a little guy. And he parked his great big boat of a, I think it was a New Yorker in behind the church because he'd come and talk to me about God. And he loved God, but he was so addicted. And he had his Confederate flag in the back window for block out the light, and he was living in his car. And those people would get that car out of our parking lot. What do the neighbors think? John died eventually, 25 years old. No deed. He told his dealer that he was going to quit. He was going straight. And so his dealer spiked his stuff and killed him. Because, then, oh, yeah, it's good for business. And everybody thinks he's got the strong stuff. Buy their stuff from him. Awful, eh? But that's how the world worked. What about the church? What do you think they did? We sat down as a board and we talked about it. And we figured it out. Said, this looks bad for the neighbors. We'll get in trouble with the municipality. At least for a little bit, give them a safe place to stay. And we did. And he lived in his car for a few weeks. Did it hurt the church? No. Did John come to church and worship God? Is he probably in heaven? Maybe because God's family actually accepted him where he was at and tried to help him move forward. The week before he died, we drove up here to Psalm 23 and talked about whether he goes there. We went down to Freedom's Door in Kelowna and talked about whether he starts that program. We went to Winfield and went to Teen Challenge and talked to them and he was trying to figure out how, where he's going to go to get his life straight before he and he died. But if we wouldn't have been his hands and feet, what would have happened? 
the disciples, they're like, you know, I'm getting a telemarketing call on my dinner time. Get rid of her. It's not always easy being God's hands and feet in our world. It's easy with your own kids. Anyways, I think we've said enough about this. We'll finish the reading and we'll keep moving. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and give it to the puppies. Yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. Your daughter was healed at this very hour. So what I wanted us to take away was, you know, we don't deserve any of the things God does for us either. Don't judge other people if they're on the same place as you. But acknowledge where you're at. It makes a big difference. That's what makes us right with God, acknowledging who He is, but also acknowledging our need of him and who we are. And we are not on the same place. Yes, he calls us brothers. But just, we're, we're created. He's a creator. There's a difference. One more miracle. We'll go real quick through it because the lessons are not nearly as big. But I think that these miracles are tied together in the Gospels. And there's a reason for it, and it's good, because I think that even Luke couldn't leave us with the whole idea of the, the dog. And I couldn't leave you there with that either. Then Jesus left that place, the vicinity of Tyre, and went through Sidon, came down to the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of, I can't pronounce it, sounds like something from a comic book, there some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged him to put his hands on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers in the man's ears. He touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, I can't pronounce it. It sounds like he's stuttering, eh? E-P-H-P-H. -P -H. <laughs> Could you say that word? Which means be opened. And at this the man's ears were opened and his tongue was loosened and began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it and people were overwhelmed with amazement. That's an interesting way of wording it. You're really overwhelmed. And he's done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. And he does some interesting things there. He quotes from Isaiah about the deaf and the mute. He quotes from Genesis about and saw that everything was well. He did everything well. Little synth seeds about he's the creator. Well, there's just one thing I wanted to talk about. If Jesus was going to heal my aunt... I think he would have done it like this, because I know my aunt. He didn't heal her. Her dad was a Pentecostal pastor for all of her life, but he never, got, never healed her. But if he did, I don't think my Aunt Alice, who's used to people staring at her, making fun of her, saying things about her she can't hear, out of touch with what people are going on around her, I think he would have taken her aside to a quiet place where there wasn't other people watching. And because he couldn't do this with the tongue and the hearing, you want me to heal your ears and your tongue? He meets us where we're at, not where he wants us to be, not who he wants us to be, not who we're going to be in him. He meets us right where we're at. And he has so much compassion. And these two stories go hand in hand, one after the other. 
if you ever hear somebody say, I hate the God of the Old Testament because he killed this and did that and slaughtered this, I don't understand God. I don't know why he didn't just heal that lady's little girl. I don't know why he doesn't do all those things the way, well, I would, especially if I knew the media was watching, especially if I knew it was going to be written down and 2,000 years later somebody like John's going to talk about what he did. You do it in a way that leaves no questioning. But I think God writes his scripture in a way that says, are you still going to question whether God is God? Is he compassionate or is he a troublemaker? He's trouble for the Pharisees who are setting up rules. We're offended for the lady. The lady wasn't offended. He meets people where they're at. I, I read a bunch of different junk about this dog thing in the past. I've read where people try to make excuses for it. Well, maybe the husband should have come, and they live in this area up there where they call the Jews dogs, and so he's just throwing her words back at them. I've read stupid things. I don't know what's true. We didn't get the whole story. But we do know God's compassionate, and he meets people where they're at. And I doubt very much if he was out in the marketplace and there was people standing around listening, he would have said, listen, why would I give to the dogs? What's... But if we're at the kitchen table and these people are screaming at me to get rid of you, and at Matthew, he says, hold on a second. I came for the people of Israel first. But he didn't say only. He said first. And then he dealt with her in a quiet, real way. I can accept that. I can say I give Jesus the benefit of the doubt that he was doing that kindly. What was his inflection like? What was the tone of his voice? What was his teaching? It certainly wasn't that we, because I think probably all of us are Gentiles or dogs. We are having to acknowledge our place in need of him and who he is. And then he meets our needs.